Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Year 11 Next Steps event at Loretto College. Thank you for joining us. I hope you're well. Um, just to let you know the format of today, um, through the next two hours, there will be a series of Q&A panels and presentations. And what we're going to do is we're going to theme each of those presentations and panels so that your questions get asked in a particular topic. So um, after my first guest today, we'll be doing a presentation on the curriculum and then we'll be moving on to transition uh, from high school and pastoral support. And then we'll be uh, looking at uh, stress and coping from uh, one of our specialist teachers as well. Um, just so you know, I can't see you or hear you, but I can see your questions and the team here will be through the day and um, so please do ask those questions and um, do bear in mind though there are a lot of you with us today and we'll do our very best to answer all your questions but it might well be that one of your questions is going to be answered in a future presentation and so we might just hold off on that answer until um, until that presentation has been done and um, if for whatever reason you have to leave the event or make a cup of tea or, or, or pause it you can do you can still rewind um, in in live time as well um, I hope you enjoy today and find it informative. If we can give you any more information, please do let us know through the day. Um, just to note that if you are thinking of applying to the college, the application forms are downloadable from our website and we'd encourage you to go there and do that as well. Um, without further ado though, um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Danny Price. I'm one of the senior managers here at the college and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first um, guest. This is Jane O'Grady, who is a head teacher at Sale High School. Um, Jane, thank you for joining us this morning. Jane, we, we invited you here for a parent's perspective because, of course, the people watching today will will be uh, parents of uh, prospective students, uh, and that insight that you have, given your experience of the college, is really um, really great. So, could you just talk us through? Yeah, great. That? Yeah, so I have three children. Um, my youngest at the moment is in year thirteen at the college, and she's studying A levels in uh, maths, biology, and chemistry. My middle son Finn finished here probably. Ooh, what am I saying now? Five years ago, actually, um, and he's currently studying for a PhD in London. And my very oldest child, uh, Charlotte, is now well came here a while ago. Did um, lots of different A levels here, but finally settled. Actually, that sounds awful, but she she um, she changed at the end of year twelve and did history, English, um, and drama A level. She's now a history teacher in Central Manchester. Fantastic. That's Correct. brilliant. Uh, just just on that, they will all have had uh, the same experience that the students have now. Yep. Uh, lots of choice, lots of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Why did they settle here and what was the sort of conversations around that? I know Loretto very, very well. So I've, I've worked with Loretto over a number of years and I was absolutely really, really keen for my students, my kids, my students, my, my children to come to Loretto. The reason being that I knew that the standard of teaching here was brilliant, which was great, and that they would do really, really well at A level. But also, more than anything else, the standard of pastoral care um, and the ethos of the college was something that I felt really, really, really aligned and drawn to um, in terms of how well the students here are looked after, uh, the spirit and the community of the place. Um, so that was really, and, and obviously as a parent, as a mum, you don't feel that you can impose your choices on your children, <laughs> but um, you do the best you can to support them in, in their decision making. And I was absolutely over the moon when our first child, Charlotte, decided to come here. And initially she wanted to do performing arts and she was thinking of doing a BTEC in performing arts, which we were wanted to support her with. Um, she wanted to go to another college, but also we felt that she was more academic than she actually believed herself to be and really wanted her to do a combination of A-levels rather, so to keep her options open really. So when she came here, she initially started uh, doing dance, drama and English, found that she was more academic, which was great, grew in more confidence, kept up with the, the drama, did dance too for a while, took part in brilliant productions here and had really, really great fun, but then really discovered a kind of more academic side, loved the history department here, um, and, and as I said, is now a history teacher. Um, my middle boy, uh, Finn, didn't do particularly well at GCSE, I've got to say, and I wanted him to come here because I knew that the tutors would really look after him, I knew the teaching would be brilliant, and also that um, he'd get that kind of pastoral support and keeping an eye on. And he did great here, he did really, really well. Um, just loved the school, loved the college, loved the community. I think for him, and I've said it before, but for him, the, the most kind of life changing event was going to India um, and visiting the Russo School in India, uh, which he did at the end of his uh, year 12 yeah. uh, with a group of people. 
did all the preparation for that and spent some time in Calcutta mm. uh, with the sisters there working in the street school. Absolutely loved it. I really, really shocked him as a person yeah. and he's doing well. Um, my youngest, still here now, um, loving it. Um, finding the sport, particularly at this time, really, really high quality. Um, the distance learning that's been provided has been second to none. You know, as a, as a head teacher running my own school, I'm jealous of the way you do it because the um, the online learning, the live lessons, the uh, the, share, the the blended approach you've had has just been great. So highly recommend Loretto on every account. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, just on that, a lot of people won't know about uh, the, the India reference that you make. Uh, Loretto is a, a worldwide institution, so we have Loretto's all over the world. Yeah. Um, and that's a project that we've heavily invested in. Every other year we would take students there. And of course, given where we are at the minute, we're not going on trips at the moment. Uh, and even our even this event is socially distanced, etc. So um, and, and we, we're hopeful uh, for the future as to how we reintroduce those things. Um, you mentioned there about being a head teacher of your own school. Yes. Uh, if I can ask you some questions about that, because um, things are, I mean, there's no two ways about it. Things are hard yep. at the minute yep. for our young people, yes. for parents and for all citizens globally, actually. Mm. So just some. Yeah, I mean, Obviously, I think going into the lockdown last March was a real shock to everybody. And I think that schools and colleges had to get very quickly to speed with yeah. how they were going to provide and care for uh, their young people at a distance. Um, and, you know, like every school and college, we stepped up. And I know Loretta certainly did last year with our youngest who was here. Um, since the students have come back in September, it's just been wonderful. It's been absolutely marvellous. Um, I know here, socially distanced, so you've got year 12 and year 13 in the year group bubbles. Similarly, in my school, we've done a similar thing. Having the year group separate and having them in at different times for break and lunch has been wonderful because it's really enabled us to actually treat each of the year groups as a small school in itself. Yeah. So that's been great. We've been really able to get to know uh, the students much more on a personal basis because we're spending a lot more time on breaks and lunch and, and with them every day. Mm. Um, I know it's been really, really hard. What I would say is the students have come back just absolutely um, dying to be back in the classroom, really. I think uh, lots of them found lockdown a bit boring. They've realised the, uh, the importance of their education and actually mm. the importance of the relationships with their teachers and being with their friends. For us, um, the thing that we're pushing more than anything else this year is that we've just got to concentrate really on that love of learning and learning yeah. for learning's sake. Yeah. Uh, lots of students are saying, well, what's going to happen? I've no idea. And to, to be truthful, you know, it, it is a time of great uncertainty, which could provoke um, cause anxiety in people. But I think the bottom line is you've just got to stick with that love of learning, the love of study, being in school, working together as a community, yeah. trying hard, being kind to each other, doing your best every day, um, and just having that positive mental attitude. And also just thinking about the whole picture. Um, sometimes I think you know, it's 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 easy just to think, you know, it's just me, it's me in this situation. Yeah. But actually every single person in the country is in the same situation at the moment. Absolutely. That should yeah. hopefully be a lot of comfort to people because when I've been in schools in the past and I've said that's part of my role of um we're doing that slightly differently as well this year, but it's you know, students even under normal normal circumstances had anxieties or nervousness yes, or, or, or things and it's just been um compounded uh, in recent times. You talked there about the love of learning, I suppose in an education setting and you referred to how the education sector's really, really done tremendous things through this time. They're in a setting whereby the teachers are experienced in their own subjects, they're passionate about their own subjects. Have you found that the, the students are talking more as in about themselves and about about it during that time? Yeah, and I think and I think in our setting and I'm sure and, and I know from experience from talking to my own daughter in your setting as well, I think we've afforded students the opportunity to talk more. So when we came back, it was very much about soft landing. We wanted to make sure because the students have been out of school for almost six months and yeah. for some of them, the contact um, you know, hadn't been there perhaps. Um, because, you know, to all intents and purposes, you can set work. We were doing fortnightly uh, phone calls home and talking to them. But that face to face contact has been really, really missing. So when our students came back in September, we had this soft landing approach where we were making and we still have it more opportunities within curriculum time mm -hmm. um, for students to sit down with tutors, talk to each other. Our pastoral team very much always, <clears throat> excuse me, 
available to talk to students as well and to talk to each other. And as I said, by merit of the fact that we're in the, these year group and uh, bubbles, they've got more breaks and lunch times. As a senior leader in school, I'm spending probably about three hours a day just on duty, which is great because I get to talk to young people and talk mm. to them about their experiences. And, and what it's about is just making them feel positive, making them feel buoyant. They've got the whole future ahead of them. Yeah. This will pass. Yeah. And at the moment, concentrate on your learning, do the best you can, we'll support you every step of the way. Brilliant. We've had some questions about applying to the college and, and obviously that's a process that they will undertake and people watching today will be thinking about that. Um, there will be nervousness around that as well because previously, uh, on an app well in any application yes. it's just predicted results as attendance as punctuality there's yeah. all those things it's probably just worth mentioning even before i ask you the question mm -hmm. that as a college we have always taken a holistic approach to applications um, and in terms of attendance and punctuality etc people will have been in a situation where they have to self-isolate and there'll be a nervousness around that so we will be supporting our schools to take into that into account as we always have done you know now more than ever so hopefully that will bring some comfort mm -hmm. What advice would you give to a parent or student at this point? Um, I mean, you've been here three times, <laughs> you know, at this point in the year that they're looking around for options. What What's the best advice that you can give to both the parent and the young person at this point in making college applications? I think the, the key thing in college applications at the moment is to think about A-levels, to, to, to talk. There will be somebody in your school and in your context who will be able to talk to you and give you advice on the best choices. Um, that might be your connections officer. We work closely with our connections officer in our school and obviously your subject teachers. Mm. Your subject teachers will be the best people who are placed there to have a conversation with you about what your opportunities are for A-level. Also aim high, aim high. My youngest daughter um, really wanted to do A-level maths but was absolutely terrified she wasn't good enough to do A-level maths, <laughs> you know. Um, despite our trying, you know, same with my older daughter, same to trying to kind of buoy her up and, and have that self-belief. So aim high, but be realistic as well. Aim high, but be realistic, um, you know, and have genuine open conversations with people. And um, Loretta will be really, really supportive, whatever you do. And I know Loretta will be fantastically supportive. Um, so they will help you make the right choice. With my youngest, again, when she came here, she started with four A-levels and, and, and Loretto allowed her to do it in year 12. Mm -hmm. She picked A-level English and maths, knowing that she would want one, but she had a taste of time to see which one she preferred. So there is always flexibility. Yeah. There is always flexibility and there is always, you know, I'm saying that, I've no idea, but Loretta will <laughs> allow that to happen. Well, I'll, I'll just clarify that because on the application yeah. board, if, if we do say if people are torn between subjects, please let us know and don't put lots down you know narrow it down to four maybe but then there's the opportunity of course after the application process whereby you will you've gone to our website you've looked at the course videos and learned about all the subjects but then there'll be an interview process as well and that will be a, a sort of one-to-one -one opportunity to discuss things and refine things but then even enrollment if things have changed that's fine and there are some circumstances we probably couldn't do it with every single student but there are some circumstances whereby there is a, a legitimate reason why a student has to for the first few weeks that they or the first couple of lessons just check out which one specifically and that will be um, checked by the head of hall and will be on a case by case basis yeah. but that's the thing i think you're trying to get out there is it's, it's about the individual yeah. and about what's right for them will not necessarily be right for the other person that's probably another thing worth mentioning as well that if, if you've got a load of friends <laughs> which is it's not always helpful is it that everyone's like i don't i know exactly what i'm going to do and i'm and that in itself can breed anxiety so if you do not know what you're doing or you don't want know what you want to do doesn't matter. And I think research and ask the yeah. questions. I think really, and, and for A level, because you spend so much time on that A level course, you've, you've really got to choose something that you love and that you're genuinely interested in. Yeah. Um, we find sometimes that when students are going for their GCSE, GCSE options, they choose a lot of courses that they, they've got no experience of whatsoever at all, just because they've no idea, you know, what they're going to do, and they choose a lot that they've never had any experience of, and, and brand new courses. Um, avoid the tendency to do that at A level, I would say. Obviously, you know, there may be a new course that you're really, really interested in, but also choose something at least that you have a genuine love for and that, you're, that you really yeah. like and that you really enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. Go with what you enjoy. I couldn't agree more. Jane, sadly, that brings us to the end of, of, our, of our time. Uh, we need to move on to the next presentation, but it's been fantastic having Great. you. Thank Lovely you so much. Here, Jane, we might have some you. questions come in, so if you can hang around and we'll get some questions for that for, for a moment. Fantastic. Um, 
I hope that was helpful for you, everyone. Our first presentation that we're going to go to today is from Dr. Graham Balfour, who is our assistant principal for curriculum, and he's going to be talking you through our course offer at Loretto. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Dr. Graham Balfour, the assistant principal of curriculum at Loretto College. I want to tell you a little bit about how you might go about choosing which courses to take at Loretto so you can meet your career aspirations. I'm also going to tell you a little bit about how our timetable is structured. We have a variety of courses at A-level and also in many vocational subjects, some of which will be new subjects to many of our students when they start their studies with us. They may include the following. As you can see, we have a variety of subjects, many of which you may never have thought about before. Some of these may even become your favourite subjects and could open up avenues into careers you had not previously thought about. A full list of all our subjects, including details about them, is available on our college website. The college offers a suite of level three vocational courses equivalent to three A-levels, which allows for progression onto university level study apprenticeships, degree apprenticeships or employment. Some students may feel they want to have a mixture of vocational and A-level subjects. Indeed, we offer these as one A-level equivalent vocational subjects which can be studied alongside other A-levels at Loretto College. We offer these courses at level two vocational level to allow students to gain access to level three courses at the college or elsewhere, or potentially gain access to employment. Students who have not yet achieved a grade four in GCSE English or Maths will also work towards this. Loretto College is also committed to support all our SEND learners in achieving the best outcomes. Our Pathways to Independence Department delivers the Preparing for Adulthood programme and offers individualised support to meet the needs of our learners. So what are our entrance requirements? The general requirements for a free A-level programme are four GCSE Grade 4s and two GCSE Grade 6s or above. Two of these six subjects should be in English, Maths or Sciences. So how might a student choose what courses they would study? If you are intending on a specific career, or progressing on to a competitive university, many of which are included in what is known as the Russell Group of Universities, then you should look at the Informed Choices website. This has detailed information on what A-levels would suit different university courses and potential careers. And indeed, it may be that you already have a clear route to a specific career in mind. However, it is our experience that that route is not always so carefully planned in advance and indeed, you will not be alone if you are unsure about what you want to do at this stage in your life. If this is the case, you should ask yourself these questions. I'd also like to assure you that just because you write down some subjects on your application form, many students can and do change their mind between submitting the form and starting with us. This is absolutely fine. I do want to give you some information as to what a student's timetable may look like. This is a very common question that many students ask. Your timetable will be constructed around a programme of study comprising your chosen subjects. All students will have tutorial and RE on their timetables as well. Some students may additionally have enrichment and support sessions included onto their timetable. Typically, there are double periods with a small break, both in the morning and also afternoon and a lesson starting at midday. There is also a common lunch on these days as well. Monday has a slightly different structure with double periods, both in the morning and afternoon, but with an extended tutorial period and lunch. Putting this together into a week could give a timetable structure like the example shown. You will note that on some days there are periods with no lessons. During this time, students are free to use the college's study centres or library and are expected to work independently. A student following a level three vocational programme could have this timetable, for example. And finally, can I please add in a few words about Loretto College as a whole? Our track record of success is, of course, that of our students. This year, 
over 1,200 students progressed on to university, with others moving on to apprenticeships, degree apprenticeships and employment. We are graded by Ofsted as an outstanding provider. And we are also pleased that we are a designated national teaching school. This means that we have national recognition in training and supporting other institutions. I am also delighted to say that we are a recipient of the Queen's Anniversary Prize for Outstanding Contributions to Further Education. Thank you for listening. Can I wish you all the best in your studies and we look forward to welcoming you as a new member of the College family in September. Hi everyone, I hope you found that informative um, and I now have live in the room uh, Dr Graham Balfour who you've just heard from for the last five minutes who's Assistant Principal for Curriculum and joined uh, with with him is uh, Michael Trefrain, our Principal and also Tracy Livesey who um, sits on the Curriculum team but is Senior Leader for um, uh, Finance and Resources at the College. Uh, so all of you have different remits but all within the Curriculum team. Thank you for joining us. Um, the first question that we want to sort of go to Graham and we get this quite a lot and we have had it already today on the question chat is the four, do I choose four A-levels, do I choose three A-levels? If you could just unpick that conundrum for us. Thank you so much for that, Danny. It is actually a very popular question and a lot of students do ask it throughout the entirety of their uh, transition from school over to college. The answer is yes, it is perfectly possible to do four A-levels and many of our students, some of our students do do four A-levels and are very successful on those four A-levels. However, it is not something that we generally recommend. There's no university course out there that requires a student to do four A-levels and also as a student progresses from lower six, particularly into upper six, we may find that a fourth A-level might actually stop them from doing other activities and that could be extracurricular activities, it could be something like the Duke of Edinburgh, it could however also be something like the Extended Project Qualification or EPQ and if there are students who are interested in applying for these very competitive university courses rather than four A-levels, I'd probably recommend that they do an EPQ instead yeah. because that allows them to demonstrate uh, research skills and learning and study habits above and beyond the A-levels. Brilliant. I mean, in your presentation, you talked about how many new subjects we have. At oh, college. absolutely. So those that won't necessarily be taught at GCSE. So uh, it's choosing the right subjects for them and doing the research. Absolutely. And many of you know our incoming students who will be starting with us in September 2021 will have a wealth of opportunities to discuss that that with the college through the enrolment process. Uh, they'll have a conversation, a dedicated conversation with the course advisor, and they'll get to decide about what subjects they want to do then. Brilliant. And very often, many of those students will come and say, oh yeah, can I do four subjects? But once they actually have that conversation, then they narrow down what they want to do, particularly in terms of what career and what courses they want to do at university. Um, they go and choose those subjects in. Brilliant. We have some questions about interview. We're going to hold on those uh, for the next uh, the next panel about transition. Graham, you mentioned uh, the extended project there. Michael, could you answer about the extended project qualification? Of course, yes. The EPQ, as, as, as Graham said, is, a, is an extra qualification that students uh, can do at the college and is a very popular choice and a very good alternative to, to a fourth uh, A-level. Uh, and they can choose any topic that, that they wish. So it's really, you know, it could be something that they really, really would want to talk about, they care about. Uh, and um, they do it, it's worth uh, half an A-level, so it gives them some focus points. Uh, usually starts toward the end of their first year, so when they're in lower six around kind of June time, and carries on uh, when they're in the upper six. Um, and needless to say, as well as being a really good uh, qualification uh, to have, it has been extremely successful at Loretto, so uh, a long week last, so very popular and very successful uh, option for our students here. Brilliant. Um, Tracy, let's ask you about the timetable because we've had questions about that, the structure of the, the day and, and obviously you do maybe an EPQ and three A-levels and or, or a, a BTEC alongside that as well. Uh, it's worth noting in your presentation you said that you can study both A-level and BTEC together. Um, how does the timetable work? So. Um, the college day runs from nine to four and um, a, a student who's studying three A-levels or a combination of A-levels and BTEC or indeed one of the extended diplomas, um, the lessons tend to be um, distributed so that you'll have long double lessons. So it could be up to two and a half hours long, so a morning lesson and then an afternoon lesson. Um, so you might be studying maths on a, a Tuesday morning and then you'll be um, in the same lesson again on Thursday afternoon. Um, so long lessons but with a break in the middle. Um, so you'll have uh, three subjects um, on your timetable or indeed the extended diploma um, and then alongside that you'll have 
um, tutorial. So on a Monday, we have a long tutorial session with Inform Tutor um, and then a, a short uh, session during the week um, and then a period of general RE and that generally makes up the students timetable. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, just on subject choices and deciding on these, there's something that, that I wanted to ask in general. And so, Michael, um, the enjoyment uh, at the college, I mean, I think we've all felt, I mean, this year particularly, uh, you know, we're all in, in different circumstances, but at the college, we pride ourselves on our very strong student community and the idea of uh, togetherness. Student enjoyment at the college, is it high? I mean, we survey our students, but is, is absolutely it... yes. I mean, uh, we, we recruit from over 100 schools in in Great and Manchester and beyond. So we've got students coming from a, a raft of community, and we've got very strong community overall uh, at the college, and then community within community with with a head of halls and the different halls that students are, are mm. into, and, and and students' feedback has always been fantastic, and and even this this year that you know the fact that you know, we are going through a pandemic, but we are fully open and you know. Students have really, really enjoyed the start of the year. We've been contacted, and I was contacted personally by parents over the, you know, the starting of the week, saying how much that their sons and daughters have enjoyed the start of the year, uh, especially as they were really quite anxious when they started in view of what was happening, yeah. and they felt really reassured and really happy of what they've done. Yeah, thank you, um, Graham. We've just got a question from Ariba on here that says, "How easy is it to get one on one time with with lectures and and tutors? Maybe a, a short yeah, thing about." Yeah, uh, I mean. Many of our staff operate, well, all of our staff operate an open door policy. So if a student is wanting to go and speak to a teacher to ask for help, we'd strongly encourage that. And many, you know, all of our staff will sit down and talk to our students to help them. Uh, you know, very often at the end of the two years, what do our students say is one of the highlights of their experience at Loreto. It's the relationships that they have with staff yeah. and being able to seek those members of staff. Uh, for one-to-one support. That's fantastic. Uh, Tracy, um, when students are choosing their choices, and Graham talked about this a little bit in his presentation, um, and he, he offered some ideas around it, but you know, you, you've worked at the college for a while and you've seen lots of different um, packages of, of, of students in terms of the subjects they choose. Does it matter if they choose like similar themed uh, subjects or if they're completely varied? What's, what's the sort of advice that we would give? Um, the advice that we would give really um, when students come in um, after the GCSE results they'll sit down with a course advisor and it's at that point really that they will um, firm up on their, their choices. Students very often we find um, they'll, they'll, they can put the, their subject choices on their application form um, but uh, often students are um, still unsure at this point so it's important to recognise that um, nothing's set in stone um, until you, you come in and you talk to your course advisor and your course advisor will help you choose the subjects um, that are appropriate for you and um, what what it is that you want to do and where you want to go on to in the future. Um, students are, as I say, they're, they're often unsure uh, about subjects um, and if and indeed about their, their career path. So what I would say really is the advice is um, do subjects that you enjoy. So subjects that you've enjoyed um, at school, um, but equally uh, have a look at other subjects that may not be on offer at GCSE. So um, we have a number of subjects, things like sociology and uh, business and, and criminology and things like that. Um, and you know, equally have a number of arts and science subjects that you may not have had the opportunity to study at GCSE. Have a look at those as well and see if um, those appeal to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We've run out of time on this panel, but um, just based on all of that information, our website is available for everyone to go to and we still have all the open day materials as well so every single subject has a video uh, for their department please check that out because we have over 40 subjects at the college uh, a levels and btechs and we want you to really make the right choices for you um, and uh, and have a look through those uh, we're now going to go to our next uh, presentation for the next 25 minutes you'll hear from our assistant principals for student services jonathan leach and kate carr and they're going to take you through the idea of transition to college from high school and also pastoral support we'll be joined by them with our deputy principal andrea pritchard in uh, after 25 minutes um, and if you did just join us don't worry you can rewind uh, and see what we've just done um, and just talked about thank you very much enjoy the presentations Hi, my name is Kate Carr and I'm one of the assistant principals and heads of student services here at Loretto I'm going to talk to you today about your son or daughter's transition from school to college. 
And before I started working at Loretto, I worked in a large, diverse, busy high school, and I myself made that transition from that high school environment to a sixth form college environment, just like the students will do. And it did mean that I saw firsthand the differences that students need to get to grips with when they join the college. As college teachers, we have to understand where the students have come from, you know, what's their experience been when they've been at high school, so that we can plan best to help them to achieve fully when they join us. Therefore, as a college, we do pay very careful attention to lots of the changes taking place in school, and we work closely with our partnership high schools, and many of the other schools that we have excellent relationships with, to ensure that not only are we fully up to date with the changes in things like exams and the curriculum and assessment and the different pressures in schools, but also that we ensure we plan effectively to take those changes into account in a way that will best help our students' chances of success. There have been lots of curriculum changes in recent years, both at GCSE level and at A level. And for parents and carers, we can only imagine how confusing this might all seem. There's been the removal of modular exams and of coursework. There's been the introduction of the new GCSE grading system with numbers now being used rather than letters. And many of these changes have been done in stages, which has perhaps added further to some of the confusion. We know that students will face challenges and changes when it comes to their new college subjects with new content and different concepts involved but also just in the more general move from coming from a high school to the whole new world that is sixth form college. As parents and carers, we're sure that you want to support your son or daughter, but we understand that it can appear quite daunting. But as parents and carers, you can relax, you can be cool, calm and collected because that's our job. Our job is to ensure that we support your sons and daughters to navigate all of the changes that they'll be faced with. We know it's a changing landscape. We know certainly recently there's been lots of uncertainty, but at Loretto we plan strategically and we've devised a variety of different strategies that will help us to ensure that our new students will continue to achieve the outstanding results that we have been achieving for many, many years here. So some examples of what we do. As Dr Balfour noted in his presentation, we hold internal exams for low six students and as a teacher and I teach history, I know that these are vital for students for a number of reasons. It gives us accurate data on how our students are performing and that means that we can intervene and provide additional support or challenge where necessary to help students to achieve their full potential. For the students, it gives them exam, uh, valuable exam practice and experience and it helps them to understand what is expected in their college exams. For other students, it might provide a very valuable wake up call. We know that some students arrive at sixth form to study A levels and they might not initially realise the level of work and commitment that is needed to succeed. They don't always realise that you can't cram for A levels like they may have been able to do at GCSE level. And I've taught hundreds of students and I know for some of them, when they've received those lower six exam results, they've come as a bit of a shock. And I've saw huge changes in their effort, their work ethic, attendance at revision sessions, etc., for subsequent exams. So we know that the internal exams are very important. Under the previous modular system, students had the option of resitting different modules, but that's no longer an option. And so students need to know that right from their first year, their work does count. They need to work hard and be on the right track and set themselves up for a successful second year. So when we hold internal exams, we recreate a meaningful experience for students. We want them to know it will be beneficial for them. And of course, we give that message to students so that they understand. Departments use a variety of strategies to monitor students throughout their courses and also to help students become more aware and more responsible for their own progress. We hold progress reviews throughout the year and they are also available to view on our parent portal and these provide a snapshot of a student's progress across their subjects. Students then have one to one conversations with their subject teachers and then follow up on these and make action plans with their form tutors to focus on how they can further improve. We use an electronic mark book where teachers record results of tests, essays, performances and practical work, etc. And again, students can monitor this against their target grades and can track their own progress. 
Many of our subjects have subject support programme lessons, which is an additional one hour per week in smaller groups, which focus on revision, exam skills and building confidence. And many of our staff hold drop in sessions during lunch times where students can go along and ask for additional support or guidance. We very much focus on the journey that students are on for two years. We spent a lot of time ensuring at the beginning of the year that they choose the correct courses for them. We then have the previously mentioned progress reviews throughout the year. We hold parents evenings for both lower six and upper six students. We provide students with a huge range of support in terms of planning for what they might want to do post college and looking at the different options available, including advice on universities, apprenticeships and employment. And then at the end of the lower six year, students create a summer action plan to consolidate their learning from lower six and to prepare themselves for upper six study. And then in upper six, we continue with this journey with more progress reviews and other parents evenings and other internal exams in preparation for final examinations. It must be noted that although the removal of modular exams and the old AS levels does pose some difficulties in terms of restrictions on resets and students having to retain knowledge for much longer, we do know that for many of our students, the new system, the linear system is much better in that the external exams take place at the end of two years. And this gives students you know, more time to practice, to grow and to develop, which results in higher grades for many. So we've looked at some of the curriculum challenges that students might face, but what about some of the general challenges faced when it comes to the transition from high school to college? Students join us from high school where they've probably been for five years and there they know the staff and they know the other students and it's comfortable to them, it's familiar. They have very little unstructured time and we know that some schools give minimal homework and encourage students to complete work in school rather than independently at home. So when students go on to college, understandably, they will find sixth form study a big change. We know that initially it can feel like a very big college to new students, but I always liken it to when your son or daughter first moved from primary school to secondary school. Secondary school felt so big when they were first in year seven, but now they're top of the school. They know it like the back of their hand and it's exactly the same with college. In the first few weeks, we have staff all across the college grounds helping to direct students so that they don't get lost. And within a week or so, the students are absolutely fine. They soon suss out all of the shortcuts around the campus. Our campus is enclosed. We have a strict ID card policy. So we know that it is only Loretto students that come onto site. And our students really appreciate that, knowing that this campus is just for them. Some students initially find the length of the college day and the length of the lessons a big change, especially if they've got a longer commute than they were used to at school. It's really important that students are having breakfast and that they're getting enough sleep and they're not on their phones or the Xbox until the early hours, because that way they can fully focus on getting the most from their college lessons. The amount of homework required will be a lot more than they're used to at school. We know that practice makes perfect, especially when it comes to exams. All of our departments use past exam questions and we focus as much on exam technique and on skills as we do on content. So we use lots of things like sample answers, peer marking activities, ensuring that the students understand the mark schemes as well. And again, this is all key to building that confidence. It's a fast moving world as far as technology is concerned and we have the latest technology in our classrooms. We know that for many of our students, they are you know, almost biologically attached to technology and to their phones nowadays. And I think sometimes we're lucky if they might look up and grunt at us a few times. Um, but we do know on a serious note that there are lots of positives to the use of technology and we do try to tap into this. So we use lots of online revision materials and apps. We have subject websites and also My Loretto, which is our intranet system. And this helps students to access all of their resources, both during their study periods and whilst at home in the evening studying too. A key aspect of our work is listening to our students. Many of our students have such well-developed skills and ideas, and I would certainly say that our students are not afraid to use their voices and tell us their opinions and suggestions. So we really try and harness that energy in all of those good, good ideas. 
We have an academic ambassador team who attend departmental meetings and provide student voice and feedback. We also have a student voice rep team and a student council who meet regularly with senior staff and puts forward concerns or suggestions on how they want to improve their college. We also survey our students regularly so that all students have the opportunity to give us their feedback. If students find that they are struggling with managing their studies, they can ask for an appointment to receive help with organisation, revision and time management from our academic support team. I'm sure that all of you listening today are keen to find out if there's anything that you could be doing at home to help support your son or daughter to ensure they get the most out of their time at Loretto. What can they be doing and what can you be doing at home to help? Well, it's true to say that the vast majority of our students relish some of the newfound freedoms that they feel when they join Loretto. They don't have to wear a school uniform. They have chosen the subjects they want to study. Perhaps they're traveling that little bit further than when they were at school. And many of them get very excited about the prospect of free periods. However, as I often tell the students, free periods don't exist. They are an urban myth. They are not free periods. They are study periods. And we don't give them to students because we are nice. We give them because they need to use them to study. Our college day is from 9am till 4pm, but students won't be in lesson for all of that time. We don't force them to come in at 9 o'clock or to stay until 4pm every day. And some students prefer to work at home, but we do encourage them to make effective use of their study time, whether that's at home or on site. We have three study centres with quiet spaces and lots of computers available at college. And we also have an incredibly well resourced student library. In tutorial sessions, we help students to plan out how will they will use their study time to consider when they will do their homework and when they will complete their ongoing revision. If a student's completely up to date with everything and they want to lie in once a week, then of course that's fine. But they should not see their study periods as time off, but rather crucial to using in order to achieve success. Students also need to consider using time in the evenings and at weekends to complete homework and revision. We know that many of our students will get part time jobs when they join college and that's fantastic. It helps them to develop key skills, earn a bit of money and gain some independence. But we do also talk to them about not taking on too many hours at work because it can start to impact on their college performance. So from a parent and carer's perspective, just keeping an eye on your son or daughter, checking that they seem to be studying outside of lessons and whilst at home and they're not taking on too many work hours is always a good idea. As mentioned earlier, students will be sitting exams after two years of studying and that means they need to be really well organised in terms of their notes, resources and revision materials. So ensuring they have dividers, files, plastic wallets, etc, rather than just piles and piles of loose scraps of paper stuffed into the corner of their bedroom. At college, we do carry out periodic file checks where we check that students have the correct resources. But if you do see a pile starting to mount up on the bedroom floor, then please do encourage your son or daughter to ask for help in college, because the last thing that students need in the run up to their exams is having to spend a few days reorganising all their folders and finding notes that they may have lost when they should be using that time to revise. It is, of course, incredibly important to praise your sons and daughters when you can see that they are working hard. We know our young people today feel that they're under a lot of pressure regarding their education in terms of the job market, social media pressures, etc. And they can be really hard on themselves. Yes, some pressure is good. It helps to keep them on track, but reassuring them, praising them and congratulating them when they're doing well and working hard is so important. And finally, if you have any concerns, always give us a call. I've spoken to many parents who say, well, once they move to college, I thought I shouldn't maybe get as involved as much as I used to, but that's definitely not the way we do things at Loretto. We very much see ourselves as working in partnership with our parents and carers. So communication is very important and we're always happy to discuss any concerns so we can provide the very best support. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of today's event. Welcome to this presentation on the support offered to students here at Loretto. 
My name is Jonathan Leach and I am one of the Heads of Student Services. We are proud that at Loretto we are renowned for our care for students. This has been recognised by our good friends at Ofsted who have praised the work of teachers, leaders and support staff in having high expectations of our students. We know that providing excellent support for students during their time with us is vital to their overall happiness and success, something we want for each member of our community. As you'd expect, students are at the very heart of everything that we do at Loretto. We know that making the transition from high school to college is a big step. So we want to make sure that students have the very best support around them to help with that transition and to give them all the help and guidance they need across their two years of study. Each student has a tutor who they will see weekly. More about that in a moment. We have our fabulous careers team for one-to-one -one guidance and for a whole host of events and opportunities throughout the year. Our college counsellors for those students who need more direct support with their social, emotional and mental health. Our chaplaincy team providing spiritual support and a friendly welcome. Our student welfare officer, who is again available to provide support to students in need. And she works very much alongside our safeguarding team to ensure that all students feel safe, secure and supported both in college and in their home and personal lives. And our wonderful academic support team who provide help for students who need that additional guidance to make progress in their chosen subjects. These teams all work together with the Heads of Hall team and with myself and Kate Carr as the Heads of Student Services. You'll be hearing from Kate shortly. Well, Loretta is a large community and a busy, diverse and vibrant place. This makes it a great place to study. And to help students feel part of our Loretto family, we are organised into 12 different halls. Our halls are named after important saints from across the world or women who are associated with the founder of uh, Loretto, Mary Ward. St. Cito is the best of these halls. Can you guess which one I'm in? But the reality is they're all brilliant and they all help our students to get a sense of identity and belonging with the head of hall working to support students with any pastoral and academic needs they may have. A little bit like a head of year does at high school. It's important for you to know as well that the head of hall is the main contact person between parents and carers and college. So you can always contact the head of hall if you've got any inquiries, concerns or issues that you wish to raise. We are always happy to help. I mentioned about our weekly tutorial sessions. These classes provide a good opportunity for students to meet with their tutor. The tutors will pass on information and notices, respond to any uh, issues or concerns that, they may, that may have been raised, and they'll be on hand to celebrate successes and achievements. And tutors deliver Loretto's tutorial programme, which covers a broad range of themes, which we've categorised into three areas. As you can see, over the two year programme, we cover lots of themes. In careers, we help students to consider their post-college options and employability skills. In student life, we look at wider community themes that affect young people, including how they can develop good study routines and make progress across their studies. And under the theme of well-being, we explore topics of interest and concerns for students, including safeguarding issues, mental health, and so on. These themes are also supported by our whole assemblies, which again mark the different stages of a student's journey through Loretto. And they include our termly award celebrations where we acknowledge the successes of our students. The support offered through our tutorial program is again something that's been recognised by Ofsted. And we know that students really value the relationship they have with their tutor during their time with us. We take our support for families very importantly too. As mentioned, the friendly neighbourhood Heads of Hall team will be your main contact between home and Loretto. What a fine looking socially distanced team they are. You can contact the Heads of Hall by phone or email and we are always happy to address any questions you may have to share information with you and so on. We do recognise that you've placed an awful lot of trust in Loretto by sending your sons and daughters to us. And that's certainly not something we take for granted 
And we know it's important that we work together with you to help our young people achieve their very best and to be happy at college. We also know, of course, that our students will transition to adulthood during their time with us. So it's important too that we collectively help them to gain more independence and more responsibility so that we can help equip them for such skills as they prepare for university or apprenticeships and employment. Our parents' evenings take place during lower six and upper six, and they allow you to have brief chats with your, your children's teachers about their progress and areas for development. Students will receive termly reviews from their subject teachers, focusing on their progress and development and sharing the students working at grades, which give them an idea of what is working well and what they need to do to improve further. At the end of lower six, the end of year reports, give a summary of how your sons and daughters have progressed during their first year of study. Subjects will provide a lot of support for students during their time with us, including drop-in sessions, independent study programmes, revision sessions, and really excellent online resources available through SharePoint and MyLoretto. We know that good attendance and punctuality are keys to success. Of course, we monitor this very closely at Loretto and encourage our students to have a very positive attitude to this and they respond to that really well. It helps them to develop good employability skills too. Our students are very familiar with our drive to be on time every time. Now students can, uh, can access resources and information through My Loretto, but we also have our parent portal for parents and carers. And you can use this to notify us of any unavoidable absences, you can also access the student reviews through the portal and it also includes further information and resources for you. Of course, students come to Loretto to gain excellent qualifications, but we also know it's important to develop their wider skills and experiences too. And so as part of their enrichment, every student enjoys a period of RE each week. We're a Catholic college, of course, but we welcome students of all faiths and not. There may be changes to friendship groups as friends go to other colleges and students will find themselves in classes with lots of new faces. Double K. Oh, absolutely not. The independent nature of the becoming more independent. Well, what, are they, what are they doing on that slide? Yeah, can also be a big challenge for them. <laughs> so again, you can relax and know that we are well aware of these issues and that we plan for them. <laughs> Our staff provide a wide range of activities, oh, you're, you're proper, you're learning you're styles, and to help to keep students engaged. Proper, yeah, what's name this now, aren't you? We encourage group work, discussion, but also independent thinking and quiet time when appropriate. We lengthen the length of activities over time to help students to adjust. And we have a really important role to play at college in that we have to bridge that gap between school and university or employment. And we can't treat students like school children. We, you know, we have to encourage them to grow and to develop into young adults. But we do this gradually and we do it over time to help build their confidence. We, we recognise the importance of supporting students' personal development during their time with us. So many of our students are excellent participants in sport, for example including those that play for local and national teams. What an impressive bunch of students these are. We support them by ensuring their timetables allow for these additional commitments. Our picture here is of the Freshers' Fair, which usually takes place at the start of term in September. Now you'll see this is a pre-COVID photo, but our Freshers' Fair highlights the many enrichment opportunities and events that are available to students at college. Now we're a little restricted with some of those opportunities at the moment for obvious reasons, but we are finding new and inventive ways to ensure students can broaden their wider experiences at college. Because we know how important these are, we really do encourage students to get involved in extracurricular activities, both in college and elsewhere. Loretto is an international community and we support our fellow schools and colleges in India and South Sudan. In particular, students can volunteer to work at our schools in Kolkata every couple of years and we raise funds and awareness for our sister schools uh, during assemblies and through tutorial and so on. 
Many of our departments also offer a range of trips and visits linked to their curriculum areas, heading to places like the USA, Iceland, Germany and so on, as well as more local opportunities. And we hope that these will be able to resume once travel restrictions ease. Many of our students join Loreto with a fantastic set of GCSE qualifications from their high schools. Our High Achievers programme seeks to support, encourage and challenge these students to continue their strong academic success through their A-level studies. For some, this may include aspirations to study at the very best universities, including the Russell Group universities and Oxford and Cambridge. For Oxbridge applicants in particular, there is a comprehensive set of opportunities and support to help students be prepared for these very rigorous courses. Our high achiever tutor groups provide an environment that seeks to encourage students to aim high, but you'll find that this is something that is instilled in all Loreto students, and it's one of the reasons why our students do so brilliantly. We're delighted to share with you that this year, 23 of our students met offers for Oxford and Cambridge. That is a fantastic achievement. We also provide considerable support for students seeking to study very competitive degrees in medicine, dentistry and veterinary science. These are demanding and popular courses which quite rightly look for the very best students. The college's MDV team provides excellent guidance in helping students with their university applications to great success. A phenomenal 75 students met their offers for these courses this summer. Now many of our students do go on to excellent university courses and they're given lots of support and guidance to help them with their applications. Our Heads of Hall and Careers team will also provide plenty of support too for those students looking at apprenticeships, volunteering and employment. We're very much aware that students are with us for a short but crucial time in their education, but we are so proud of the amazing achievements that they make with us at college and those that they go on to achieve in the next stages of their lives. I hope this presentation has given you a good idea of some of the support that we offer here at Loreto. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it to be useful and informative and that you enjoy the rest of the Your Next Steps event. Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you found those last two presentations really informative. If you've just joined us, remember you can, of course, uh, rewind and see all the other presentations that we've had today. We've got some questions published um, there for you, and we've also been uh, answering questions uh, directly through the day as well. Thank you for your questions, um, and I hope we can answer some more here. So I'll just introduce our panel. You'll have already heard from Kate Carr in her presentation on transition. Uh, Jonathan Leach uh, on his presentation on pastoral support at the college and also uh, our deputy principal is here, Andrea Pritchard. And so I'm going to ask some questions there. Andrea, we'll just start with um, coming to the college and for students who will have been in a high school, which will probably be smaller in number um, than the college. If you could just talk them through that, uh, please. Yes, certainly. I mean, we are a large uh, sixth form college uh, and undoubtedly will be larger than the institutions that the young people joining us will be used to. Um, and we are very, very aware of that. And there are lots and lots of benefits to joining a large sixth form college. There's all kinds of things that we can offer across the college. And also all of our staff are specialists in teaching A-level uh, and advanced level uh, courses, which is a huge benefit to our students and lots of other specialist provisions that we can put in place. So every year, very large numbers of our students applying to university and so on and therefore our staff become uh, really able to guide and advise because that's a huge part of their role within college and um, but of course when young people join us uh, knowing that they're joining a large institution can sometimes uh, uh, be a little bit of a worry for them and they wonder how they're going to fit in and how that's all going to feel we're very we're very aware of that so within our whole college community we're very keen to be able to create communities within that community we do that by breaking down uh, the college into 12 separate halls so each student uh, joins a hall has a head of hall uh, leading that uh, group of students and within that therefore uh, is really part of that smaller community and becomes a part of that in that way and hopefully therefore really feels able to identify with the college values and, and all that that can offer for them. 
Brilliant, thank you. And if I could just ask John because you're head of all yourself alongside Kate, yeah. do you oversee that head of all team? Um, as a really important part of our, our college provision and um, particularly the tutorial programme and the aspects of that. Could you talk? Yeah, absolutely. We think it's a really important part of college life. It's a big change to come from high school. We do recognise that. So the tutorial system, so a student sees a tutor every week, it's really good to be able to develop that relationship. All our tutors are teachers as well, so they've got that real expertise. Uh, the heads of all team as well, a bit like a head of year is at school, has a really good overview of the student's progress, um, both academically but also pastorally as well. Somebody that can give a lot of support to students during their time. So we think it's really important that students quickly settle into college. Yeah that it feels part of their community, that they feel part of, uh, of Loretto and that they're really happy because we know our, our happy students will be successful. Yeah, absolutely, thank you very much. And um, Kate, we've had some questions today about um, independent study. Tracy in the previous panel was talking about um, the timetable and I know you, you refer to the urban myth in your presentation of, of, of free periods. They're not they're not a thing, but they that we treat them slightly differently. Just want to talk us through that in the event that students will need to do their independent study and we, we encourage them to, what advice are we giving them? Well, I think it is a change for students because they join us and they're not used to having that kind of unstructured time and um, they don't necessarily have that at high school. So it is a change for, for students when they do join us. But I think we have to remember the students have chosen the subjects they want to study. They're the subjects they're most engaged in. They're the subjects they're motivated um, you know, to, to continue with that study. And so when they have got that study time, they are focused and they use that study time very productively. And we know that some students will need support. And through the tutorial system, uh, Mr. Leach just mentioned there, we, we do train students with that. So they are given lots of support in terms of planning their study periods effectively and mm -hmm. um, how to complete homework, which is crucial for success, but also um, revision and consolidation work, exam practice work to, to help to develop that independence. And uh, we have things like success program for students who might need some additional support. And um, that's a program where they'll focus on a different topic every week. So it might be how to manage exam worries one week. It might be uh, um, time management the next. It might then be uh, different revision strategies that, that students might find helpful. So there's lots and lots of support available. And I'd say that our students really you know they thrive on that independence and they certainly leave us kind of ready for the for the challenges ahead whether it's university or employment because that's a crucial part of what we do to help our students grow into young people brilliant thank yeah. you uh, John T, just as you know as a very experienced a member of staff head of hall and senior leader at the college you've you've met with lots of students and encountered those students who will need support you just talk through a little bit because i'm sure there's there's people watching who they might feel that they're struggling at high school but don't want to say or yeah. those sorts of things and maybe just talk us through um advice and also what's on offer there for them yeah i think it, i think it's true it, again we, we want to make sure that our students feel feel successful and happy in what they're doing and i think one of the great strengths of the rest of people always say about our college is that, that, that students do feel as though staff are very approachable they're very helpful there's an awful lot of support that is available both yeah. in terms of that academic support if they're struggling with a particular subject or particular skills um, or if they, you know, they've got kind of things that are going on in their own personal lives as well that they're finding challenging. And we do encourage our students to be very open about that, you know, as they, as they, as they, you know, come into college and they, you know, get to find those new relationships with their teachers and tutor and the head of hall to really trust that, you know, we are there to support them and to help and guide them. Um, and we do, you know, there's, there's lots of support available. Our academic support team do fantastic work to help students really develop those skills that they need. Things like emotional support through our counsellors, through the wellbeing officer and so on. You know, there's an awful lot of support available. Even you know, when students aren't sure about what they want to do in terms of their future careers or employment opportunities, that is on offer as well to be able to support them and give them that guidance. So we do find that our students do really settle into that, you know, very, very quickly and very easily. Um, and they do find it just to be a very supportive environment to study in. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, we've had a, a lovely question, um, Kate, about leadership and uh, roles of responsibility. A lot of our students at school will have will have experienced some of those. What are the opportunities for leadership and responsibility at Loretto? Uh, well, I think it's key because part of the Loretto ethos is about developing the whole person. Of course, we want to support and focus on the academic side and achieving those key qualifications, but a Loretto education, we would say, is much more than that. Yeah. It's, a, it's that broader kind of support in terms of developing those key skills. And, Certainly when you want to stand out, if you're applying for universities, apprenticeships are 
employment you want to show the best of yourself but also just to get a fantastic experience while you're here and um, so we do have lots of opportunities every single tutor group has a student voice rep and they will collect ideas and feedback from their fellow students and pass that on to our student counsellors so we have a formal student council as well they meet with myself um, and other i kind of pass on to the other senior leaders the suggestions and ideas and any concerns that students have and they've been quite, quite instrumental in some of the changes recently they're always very keen to look at what food we're offering in the cafeteria and um, the reward system that we introduced a few years ago was very much driven by the student council and the students um, but in, in addition to that, we also have departmental academic ambassadors and that's where a student might represent a particular department in a subject they're studying and they'll give feedback to those teaching staff about resources, about what support students might feel they need or if there's events taking place, the students will get involved in that. Uh, we also have lots of charity initiatives. We have a lot of the work that the chaplaincy team do. Um, but lots of the extracurricular activities that we offer at Loretto really help to hone those leadership skills, but teamwork, communication, so that students get the most out of their time, contribute to the college, but more importantly, they develop themselves and they, yeah. they get to take those skills forward for the next step. That's brilliant. Um, it's, it's amazing when you when you sit and listen to what we do offer. There's a lot there. Um, just talking about responsibility and roles, this fits into what we might want to hear about from our students when they apply to us. And we had some questions here about what do I need to put on the application form? Should I include a personal statement? Andrea, you oversee the admissions process at the college. Uh, it is a paper based system. They download it from the website and obviously that deadline in January, the 8th of January, what, what should a student be including in their application form and, and how do they go about it? Well, I mentioned before about how important our community is and we do want students to come to Loretto and, and contribute and take part in our community. Uh, of course we want them to attend the lessons and enjoy the lessons and, and uh, achieve academic success but it is also about young people making those contributions being part of college in its true sense. So if they can put on an application form where they've already demonstrated some of those skills, some of those involvements in different things, maybe they've been a prefect in school, maybe they've led a group in school, maybe they do something outside of school that they're, you know, a, a sporting activity or something else that they're already involved in, all those things go down very strongly on their application form and they can really express that. Sometimes young people haven't had the opportunity to do something as formal as that, but it might be that they're doing something even within their own family. Maybe they support their, their parents with looking after young siblings and so on. So anything that they do, they will be able to demonstrate. They started to develop maybe some of the leadership skills that Kate was just talking about, or were they giving something back and contributing? We're really, really interested in hearing about that. And we do tend to find when we look at those uh, applications that we've seen, and we see many thousands of them every year, um, that young people are really keen to be able to share the skills and gifts that they're developing yeah. and it's a joy to read and that's why we have such a vibrant community at college. Um, just someone literally just asked, is the personal statement really important? I mean that's a great question, <laughs> just, 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 just answer that. So yes it is and we do look really carefully at those and we also look at them from a different point of view as well and that uh, if we've got any events and activities coming up we, uh, and we make an offer to the young person, we've already gathered that information so we can then contact them to say so we've got an event in music, would you like to attend or be part of that? Or we've got a sporting activity coming up. If you've mentioned that you, you know, you're interested in a particular sport, would you like to attend? We would run events for students to run us around. Students might be interested in careers around uh, medicine, dentistry, and veterinary science. So there's all sorts of reasons to, to raise as much as you can about yourself in that personal yeah. statement. But it is in its own right a really great skill to start to develop. Absolutely. Because yeah. we're trying to develop next steps for you this is the first step forward away from school mm. and they will leave us many of them go to university also into employment and it's about young people being able to sell themselves with those skills of doing so brilliant um and i welcome to um john Timmer. we've had a question about anxiety and support for that but just another thing we've had another question on on uh, interviews uh, we're at the point where they're applying the interviews are done in sort of february march time and there's a lovely question are you interviewed by just any teacher or are the interviews done by an admissions team uh, if you could just answer that, Andrea. Um, we look very carefully at every application that comes in and when a young person is interviewed, we do our very best to ensure that if they've indicated, uh, well, uh, as they will indicate the subjects that they're interested in, as far as possible, they, it is a teacher that will interview them and a member of teaching staff from one of those subjects will interview them. It isn't absolutely 100% the case, but 
but 99% of the time it is. Yeah. Um, and therefore, we've got interviewing that young person who can speak in detail and, and uh, you know, with enthusiasm and, and, and really interested about at least one of the subjects. And we often tend to find that it's just a cluster of subjects that they're interested in, so they might pick a range of sciences or um, a, a, a number of art subjects. So obviously there can be that crossover of mm. interest and expertise from staff around a number of subjects that young people could apply. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, so yes, the question about anxiety, Dante, is, is there support for students uh, with anxiety and obviously well, well versed in this, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, obviously we know that you know there are students who will, will struggle with uh, different aspects of their mental health, including anxiety and so on. Um, we're very open in college about you know the receiving support for that. It's really important that students do access some sort of support guidance, yeah. uh, both either that could be within college through again talking to the head of hall or, or to you know members of staff that they can trust our wellbeing officer. We have student counsellors on site as well, but we're also very good in terms of liaising with external agencies as well. So whether that could be through places like CAMS, Emerge, and so on, it will depend on which part of uh, Greater Manchester students are coming from, which access, yeah. which services are available to them. Um, but we recognise that that's a really important um, experience that some of our students, you know, go through and, and have, and we're, we're very, very keen to be supportive on that. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Sorry, could, I would just also just like to add to that. We, we do recognise in college that young people join us and they're with us for two years and the support needs that they might have at the beginning of that time could be very different to those at the end. So it's very flexible what they are offered and can, you know, they can uh, join in and leave support as and when they feel is appropriate to. And we're also very keen uh, that we do not see this as a one size fits all. So as you mentioned that huge amount of support is available to students. So in a sense they can, you know, pick and choose whatever support is right for them. And it can be very different depending on that student's needs and what they feel they need help with. Yeah. And I would say there as well, it's just about um, us understanding what the needs of the students and listening to the students as well. Yeah. Sometimes it might be that students are anxious around particular deadlines or a particular piece of work. It might be that they're worried about working one subject and not another. And a key, key part of our pastoral system and why you know we put such emphasis on our pastoral system is that so every student has a tutor, they can go and speak to that tutor, it won't be necessarily one of their subject teachers, but they can go and they can express any worries, they can come to the head of hall, they can express any worries, any concerns, and sometimes it might just be they need that reassurance or they want the head of hall to broach a subject teacher because there's a particular issue with an aspect of work that they're struggling with. Mm. And sometimes it can be that low level support that can really make the difference. Mm. Sometimes students might just need an extra day to complete a piece of work and that can make all the difference. So again, the support that, that Johnson's mentioned and Andrew's mentioned, it's crucial and it's the students knowing that they can come to us and yeah. not feeling like they can't. Absolutely. Um, we've got one minute left. I, I suppose I just want to ask you all about just advice. I mean, you, you we've all talked to students when they enrol or in a high school setting or where they are right now and where they all are at home right now what is the best piece of advice that you can give them in terms of how they approach either their application or indeed their, their schoolwork now because we've mentioned the word anxiety there's going to be a lot of that now isn't there so what advice what's the best piece of advice we can give them i suppose Jancy? i would say um in terms of where we are at the moment in terms of you know completing your gcse uh, qualifications Again, seek all the support you can from school and, and try your very best. Yeah, thank you, Kate. I mean, as, as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, excuse me, I taught in high school, so I know some of the pressures that students will feel. And like John said, access the support from the staff, attend the revision sessions, listen to the advice about homework. And ultimately, all you can do is try your very best. And if you work hard, try your best. That's all we can we can ask. It's all that anyone can ask. And we will then support you when you come to join us. Brilliant. Andrea? I would echo what's already been said really, uh, teaching staff in schools are the experts in GCSE, so I would advise every year 11 student to absolutely follow that advice and to be just the best version of themselves. So it doesn't matter what those grades are, it's about making sure that those uh, grades are best for you as an individual. And uh, by doing that, nobody can ask any more from you. Uh, making sure that you do take some time for yourself uh, in year 11 as well. Have some joy, have some downtime. You know, it's so important that we all do uh, do that and keep things in proportion. And make sure you do lots and lots of research in terms of planning your next steps, because there's a whole range of different options out there. Uh, not all of them will suit everybody. It's about what's best for you. Yeah, brilliant advice. Thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you for listening. Uh, on to our final presentation before our last Q&A. And we're going
going over to Jane Williams, who has uh, created a presentation on stress and coping. Um, thank you very much and we'll see you in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jane Williams and I'm going to be talking to you about stress and coping with your youngsters. There's going to be three parts to the talk. I'm going to do a general introduction into stress, which has got quite a lot of psychological research to back up some of my claims. I'm then going to look at how to recognise stress in your youngster, also as well as yourself. And then finally, and maybe the most important bit, how to manage stress in your youngster and yourself. So before we get started, I think it's really important to recognise that even though when we think about stress, we tend to think about negative aspects of it, stress can also be positive. You know, when it comes to exams or they're meeting deadlines for their BTEC, it can help them to increase their mental activity, help them to focus their mind. For those of you who have sons and daughters who are into sport or music, you'll probably recognise that some stress feels good for them. But the big issue is about helping them to keep in balance the positive aspects with the negative aspects, which is really what we tend to think about when we think about stress. And how does stress show itself? Well, I think the obvious ones are poor health. So you might find that they get a cold and then they get rid of that cold and then they seem to get another cold and they've always got some kind of a bug and they find it very, very difficult to shake it off. You also might find that they come out of the test and they'll come home and they'll say, oh, you know, mum, I did really badly on that. I just panicked. I just completely, you know, so stressed out. I couldn't think straight. And then I think the other thing that you often see is that they often respond very emotionally rather than rationally when difficulties arise. There's been quite a lot of psychological research into individual differences and stress. Um, and the two main areas I want to focus on with you is gender and personality. I'm just going to talk briefly about gender and then I'll go into more detail about personality. So in terms of gender, what we tend to find is that males and females, so your sons and daughters, often have quite different responses to stress. So your sons are most likely to demonstrate the typical fight or flight response. Now, it might show itself at home as them burying their head in the sand, e.g. with the duvet covered over the head when they've got exams in two weeks time or even two days time. Whereas what we tend to find with girls and so your daughters tend to be they more adopt a strategy known as tend and befriend. And this is a strategy whereby they seek out people to talk to about how they're feeling. Well, it might be to you, it might be to their friends, it might be to their siblings if they have any, but the key thing is they talk about how they're feeling and they affiliate with other people. And people believe this is partially due to the role of a hormone called oxytocin. Now, interestingly, oxytocin, both males and females have it, but the effect of oxytocin is dampened down by the effects of testosterone. And that's why females tend to demonstrate this tend to befriend strategy more than males. Have what I really want to talk to you about is the research into the area of uh, stress and personality. So Friedman and Rosenman, psychologists, proposed the concept of the type A, type B, personality and they actually wrote a questionnaire to enable you to work out whether you're more likely to demonstrate a type A or type B personality. Now if I'm honest with you what you will find when you complete the questionnaire is that you're possibly not at one extreme end or the other but you're more towards a type A or more towards a type B. So what are these type A and type B personalities like? Now, what I want you to think is to try and see whether you actually recognise yourself and you can identify whether you're type A or type B before you actually complete the questionnaire. So here goes. The type A individual tends to be very competitive. So whenever they play a game, they play to win, whether that be Monopoly on Christmas Day or whether or not they're playing a football match or a netball game or playing golf, whenever they play, it's all to win. 
ambitious. Now, what I mean by ambitious is that it dominates their life. So getting to the top tends to be the situation that dominates their every thinking, because you will find type B individuals, individuals who are also ambitious, but it doesn't seem to dominate them in quite the same way. Impatient. Well, I always think about this. And when I was in the shops on Saturday, I was in Marks and Spencer doing my food shop and I can spot a type A individual a mile away. You spot them by they're the person who was in a queue and time, same time they're scanning all the other queues, trying to decide which queue is moving faster. And they jump from one queue to the next because they believe that queue is going faster than the other one. So really demonstrating levels of impatience which is really, really extraordinary. They often also find it really difficult to relax. So you'll find them sitting in front of the TV whilst also responding to work emails, or they're listening to music at the same time as watching TV, find it very difficult to just do nothing. So what are your type Bs like? Well, they are literally the opposite not so driven. It doesn't mean to say that they can't be ambitious, but it doesn't drive them in quite the same way as it does with a type A individual. Not competitive. So yeah, they can just play Monopoly for fun, or they can just have a game of football with their friends or with netball, and they just go and have an hour of fun. It's not, I've got to win. It's literally the taking part that can actually be quite exciting. They can do nothing and feel no guilt. It's often really apathetic, kind of very laid back, sort of, oh, come on, chill out, mum, what's your problem? You know, why don't you just slow down a bit? So what did Friedman and Rosenhan find based on their questionnaire? Well, what they found was that type A individuals were more prone to chronic heart disease. Well, obviously that would be more about adults, but in terms of youngsters, what we may find, which comes a bit full circle from where I started, is that individuals with a type A personality may be more prone to lowered immune function. Although I've got to say that something that I find particularly interesting around this area and the age group of your sons and daughters, it's more about understanding the different personality type of your son and daughter. So let me explain. So imagine that you're a type A individual who believes everything should have been done yesterday. So uber ambitious, uber competitive, very, very time focused, really impatient. And then your son or daughter is a type B personality who just thinks everything should slow down a bit. You can see where the clashes can arise. And I think probably one of the main things I'd like you to take away from this talk today is how important it is to try and see and understand the personality type of your partner and your children. Okay, so over to the next part of the talk is where I'm going to talk to you a bit about recognising stress and how to recognise stress in your youngsters and suppose a bit in yourself. Well, there are a number of issues that I think will be very much like common sense, but there might be some you may surprise you a little bit. Now, I think this one is always tricky. And whenever I do this talk, I think about moodiness because I think moodiness can obviously be a sign of hormones and adolescence. And it's when does that become stress and not just typical adolescence? And I think more than anything, it's when you see a big change in their mood rather than just generally moody individuals. But has there been a recent change in it? Poor time management. I think this is a real biggie. I think individuals, when they're feeling stressed, and I think it's the same for us, can really underestimate how long things can take. So you say to them, have you any homework tonight? And they say, yeah, I've got about an hour. And you're sitting there in your type eight personality style going, when are you going to do it? You're going to go and do it now. And they're not doing it. And they go up to bed about nine, ten o'clock and they say, I'm going to start my homework now. Then you wake up about two in the morning and you go to the loo and the light's on and you pop your head in and they're still doing the homework because what's happened is they've underestimated how long that homework is actually going to take. So I think that can also be a sign of, of stress. Well, the next two are interesting because both insomnia, so struggling to fall asleep, stay asleep, get restful sleep and oversleeping 
can both be signs of stress. And again, I think emphasising that term before, I think the issue is about the change in behaviour. And then again, the eating, you've just gone and do your food shop at Morrison's or Little or wherever, and then you brought everything for the week and then you pop out for a couple of hours and you come back and nearly all the food's gone. And that can be a sign that they're not coping very well, although obviously we all know some people actually lose their appetite when they're feeling stressed. And I think as they get towards sort of upper six and hitting the age of 18, I think we also need to watch the way in which they drink if they do drink, because we all know that drinking can be a sign of stress. So we've had a bit of a background to individual differences, and we've also had a bit of an idea about how to recognise stress. I suppose the next bit and probably the most important bit is how do we help the youngsters to manage their stress? Well, again, there's some more psychological research to back this up, and this was proposed by Julian Rotter, who proposed the concept of locus of control. Now, locus is place. So what the locus of control is concerned with is where you place responsibility for the things that happen in your life, both the good things and the bad things. And Rotter proposed that there are two types of locus of control, an internal locus of control, whereby you believe that what happens to you is a product of your own doing and you're in control of what happens to you versus the external locus of control who believes that everything that happens to you is a product of fate or luck and there's nothing you can actually do to change it. So why is all of this relevant? Well, because external individuals with an external locus of control need to really keep an eye on because there can be a situation where they do poorly in a test and they come home and you go, how did you get on in the test? Oh, I didn't do very well. Do you know why you didn't do very well? Well, it doesn't matter what I do. I'll always be rubbish. I'll always be rubbish at English. or I'll never be able to be any good at maths. Well, that's really, really difficult because an individual with an internal locus of control will come home and say, how did you get on in your test? I didn't do very badly. Oh, do you know why that is? Yeah, mum, I just didn't do enough work. So what are you going to do next time? Oh, I'm just going to make sure I do more work because I know if I do the work, I therefore will get the mark. And so individuals with an internal locus of control, it's much easier in order to help them to deal with their stress. So we really need to keep an eye out on the youngsters for whether it's a more internal or external focus. And for those that are external, try to help them become more internal in their focus. But I think one of the key things we've got to do is help them to manage their stress. And I think this all comes from organisation, you know, helping them organise their lives. Now, I know a lot of subjects do some study skills work with their students. In tutorial, we talk about study skills and about helping to meet deadlines and organising their timetable. And I think one of the main things we need to think about is to help them learn how to balance their college life with their work if they have paid employment with their social life. And I think it's not a very easy thing to do. So one of the things I'm very keen on emphasising with the students is exercise. And what we often find is when they start in lower six that they do a lot of exercise, but then by the time they get to upper six, many of them, because they're preparing for exams or they've got deadlines for their BTEC, kind of give up the exercise. And I would say to them, it's so important that what they try to do is keep some kind of a healthy mind, especially. So finally, I think the most important aspect of helping the youngsters to deal with their stress is to ensure that when they're feeling particularly overwhelmed, that they seek some support. Now, probably the first port of call will be yourselves, or if not, it may be their friends, or it could be their personal tutor, or even a take teacher who they may feel that they've got a special relationship with. And I think the aim of what we should all be trying to help them with is to not see their problems as insurmountable and instead try to help them to break up those problems into more manageable pieces. And so when we can do that, we can help them within these manageable pieces, identify targets, small targets, manageable targets, that they can reach and then when they reach those targets it enables them to congratulate themselves because I think what's really important for us all to recognise 
is that stress is a part now of everyday life. And what we have to learn to do is to help them to recognise it in themselves. And then when they can recognise it, they can then try to develop strategies in order to manage it. Thank you very much for listening. Hi everyone and uh, welcome back and thank you for staying with us for our Next Steps event. I hope you found Jane's presentation um, informative uh, and remember there is a questionnaire to complete for that if you want to find out which type you are, whether you are type A or type B. I'm not going to ask our panel uh, what type you are. Um, as, as Jane indicated, most people are somewhere in between the two, but um, please do that for, uh, for a little bit of fun. Um, Today, uh, the last half an hour is going to be focused on your general questions that you've sent through and please do keep on sending through questions. We'll try and put them to the panel today. So I'm going to introduce our senior leadership team, uh, Michael Dufresne, our principal, Andrew Chan, deputy principal, and Tracy Livesey, who is our uh, senior leader for um, finance and resources. Um, so lots of questions, half an hour to get through it. Hopefully we'll, we'll achieve that. So Michael, first of all, we had a question about uh, can we bring laptops and iPads to help uh, learning? Absolutely, yes. I mean, we, we are very catered for, for this and we've got students at the moment who are bringing their own device on site and you'd be pleased to know that we've got excellent coverage in terms of Wi-Fi across the whole campus. So absolutely. And it's, uh, we've got no problem with that at all. Great. Uh, Trace, you had some questions sort of financially um, um, on this. So there's a few questions actually, if we can roll them together. So do we get financial support for families that go to college? Are there free school meals and uh, transport subsidies? Are there any? So there's sort of wrapped into one big question really, but sure. off we go. Um, yes, yeah, so post 16 in terms of financial support, there is something called the 16 to 19 bursary. Um, so you uh, can get more information on that when you come in to enrol, but effectively you need to um, apply for that um, and um, we will need to provide evidence um, for of uh, family circumstances, family financial circumstances um, that um, will determine whether you are eligible for that um, or not. Um, and then alongside that, where there are free college meals and again, it depends depends on uh, family circumstances, whether a student is eligible for that, but again, you can pick up an application form um, when you come in to enrol. And the final part of that question was transport. Was transport. Um, so currently the um, uh, 16 to 18 year olds can apply for the hour pass, uh, which uh, gives them free bus transport um, across Greater Manchester and a discount on the trams, I believe. So uh, that's currently available for the 16 to, to 18 year olds. Brilliant. To find out about that, they can go to the hour pass. Uh, it has website. a dedicated web yes. website for that. That's brilliant. Um, uh, sorry, thank you. Yeah jump in on there a little bit as well. Um, Tracy's quite rightly said that you know we've received a lot of applications for free college meals and bursaries and so on at the beginning of the year and we do absolutely but also we do very much recognise that um, family circumstances can change throughout their two years with us and therefore we do we're very happy to pick up applications throughout the year as well and students can come and speak to well any member of staff and they, they normally end up speaking to the head of hall mm. um, and we're very happy to support them over the year as the academic year goes through. But it's a really good point uh, thank you very much. We've had some questions about can I go off site um, the answer to that question, um, Andrea, can we go off site? Uh, yes, students, if, if they're not in a timetable class, then yes, they can go off site. So students will find that not all of their college day is taken up on in timetable lessons. We've got um, five study centres, we've got a very large library, we've got three cafeterias, we even have our own college shop. So really there is no need to go off site. You can very easily stay if you like yourself contained with on, on campus all day long. However, students are free when they're not in class to, go, to leave site. And there's lots of local shops where students particularly will go over and maybe um, you know, get themselves some lunch and so on. Uh, and then they're very welcome to bring that back onto site if they would like to. So students do go off site and they do have that freedom. And we just uh, ask our students to think carefully about how they're using that time when they're not in contact lessons with staff yeah. and there needs to be that balance between yeah go off site go get yourself some lunch of course you can um, and uh, you know uh, but equally they need to be thinking about making sure they're doing sufficient study as well yeah brilliant um michael we've had a question about assemblies now obviously this year we're we're using virtual means when when students are in class um we're not doing those big gatherings uh, of course uh, but in terms of assemblies uh, are they uh, are they every week and uh, what sort of content do we 
do we how do we use those? Yeah, so we've got assemblies every week with our, with our head of hall, uh, and we've got topics every week that you know we, we cover with all our students. So we ensure that there's consistency across our lower six and our upper six, um, and it's about developing them as 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 young adults. So we cover a range of of, of topics such as resources, preparing for their next steps, careers, UCAS, obviously for those students who want to go into universities. So there's a whole raft of topics that are covered over the two years that the students spent with us. Uh, obviously, at the moment, as, as you mentioned, Danny, uh, we are doing what we call e-assemblies. Uh, so they are, they are taking place remotely and that seems to be working very well as well. Brilliant. Uh, I'm going to direct this one to uh, Tracy, just to, with regards to interviews, because obviously it's, it's on everyone's mind at the moment. They're, they're working on their applications, they're thinking about personal statements. And so, it, uh, you know, that interview, uh, we've got a few questions. Will that be virtual? Will that be online? Will it be in person? How will that take place? Yeah, normally um, we would bring the students on site uh, for interviews, but obviously with the situation as it is this year, we are reviewing the situation and keeping it under review and um, we'll see what the, the government guidance is and uh, the national guidance is um, when we get to that point. But uh, I have to say it is probably likely that they will be held remotely this year. Yeah. OK, uh, Andrew, we've had a question about um, when we start at college, um, you know, they might be the only person in the school or they might be coming in from a school with lots of the friends and they're all coming here as well. And, and sort of a little bit of uh, nervousness around, will I be with them? Will I see them? Will I those things? So um, if you could just answer that for us, do they need to worry if they're the only person from the school coming here? And uh, also if they are from a school where lots of people are coming, will they be with their friends? Um, uh, we, we get asked this question every year and it's a very natural question and we yeah. totally understand uh, why students would feel like that. So all of our staff across the college are used to dealing with a, a very large group of students joining us every year who are new to new to site, new to the college and we have lots of procedures in place to help students settle in well, uh, lots of induction activities uh, both within academic classes and, and as well also within tutorial. But we do, we do also like to give students the opportunity to make new friends and we feel that that's really, really important because even if you're joining and some schools will send us uh, over 100 of their young people from year 11. Uh, so students will think, well, I'm joining with a, a huge group of people from my school um, and that's wonderful. But it could be that not, they're not in academic classes with those people. So it's important that everybody gets the opportunity to make new friends. Equally, you could be joining, as you've mentioned a moment ago there, Danny, uh, just singularly from your school. And so you also need that opportunity to make new friends. What's quite unusual about Loretto, though, is that all of our students have the same lunch time and the same uh, break time as every other student. So if you are joining with a group of friends from school, you will always have that opportunity, even if they're in different classes, they've picked different subjects, it doesn't matter. You'll always have that opportunity to meet your friends at lunchtime and at break times. And obviously, uh, if you're making new friends, which is what we'd want for all of our students, you've still got that opportunity there as well. Okay, brilliant. Uh, we've had a question. Uh, we did cover it before, but we'll just, just answer it quickly. Michael, how is a college day normally structured? So start and end and then a usual day. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the lesson starts from uh, nine o'clock and finish at four o'clock, although as Andrea said, uh, not all students will start at nine or finish at four every day of, of the week. Um, all students have got a common break in the morning and, and uh, a common lunch break uh, over lunchtime. Um, and as, as Andrea mentioned earlier on, when they are a time where they, they do not have lesson, uh, most of our students stay on site and to use one of the many facilities that we have, uh, and but they are free if they want to, um, to go out and, and, and come back in again later on when we've got more lessons. Great, thank you. I just had a question about leadership roles um, and what they what would be provided. Um, in the Q&A with um, uh, Kate, Jonty and Andrea, we answered that question and Kate answered that question. If you rewind, you'll be able to see that a little bit, but essentially there are plenty of leadership roles and do have a look at those presentations for that for that question. Um, Andrea, just a question here about um, the application form and personal statement um, and that they, we don't, there's not a gap on the application form for the personal statement, is there? It's sort of something we ask them to attach. So. Yeah, it, there's um, a number of questions on there that uh, encourage uh, students to tell us about if they're involved in any sporting activities or any musical activities they might be involved in or anything else outside of school um, or indeed within school as well. But many of our young people we've seen over the last few years have just decided that they would prefer to expand on that and therefore attach a personal statement or a letter of application, however, 
uh, different schools choose to direct them to do that. Um, and so they just simply attach that to it and that, that gives them the opportunity to put all their detail in, everything that they want to share with us about all the things that they're doing in addition to their studies. And also sometimes about what they've also achieved within their studies. I, I read the personal statements and you can see young people often explaining about what uh, they feel is their uh, you know, best approach to revision, what subjects they feel they're achieving really well and, and why, what additional work they might be doing outside. Uh, books they might be reading and so on or extra research they might be doing within a certain um, subject area or topic that's come up in class. So it can cover a whole range of different things. It's what that young person wants to uh, share with us in terms of supporting their application. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Michael, I'll come to you with a question about um, in a moment about uh, a student who is can, has, a, has a more local sixth form to them and he's thinking and when we're a further distance so just in terms of you know um, distances and, and the advantages and disadvantages of that maybe in a moment uh, class sizes come up as a question Tracy could you just ask that in general what are the class sizes? So uh, it does depend on the subject um, but generally around the sort of 2022 mark uh, would be a, a usual class size for us. That's brilliant okay so Michael um, the question has a very specific context for that individual but actually it's a good question to talk about in terms of uh, students in Manchester have uh, a range of uh, offers, uh, opportunities available to them in terms of college provision. Um, could you just talk through, um, we have students who come here from as far as Glossop and further actually. So Absolutely, so we recruit from, from over 100 schools in Greater Manchester and, and, and from beyond. Um, and what, what I've always said is that don't let transport stop you coming from to, to yeah. outstanding education. And I think that's a really important thing. And it actually, you know, is, is, is a good thing because in life, not many of them kind of you know, wake up in the morning, you know, shower, get dressed, have breakfast, walk 50 yards down the road and we're at work. <laughs> you know, we commute. England is a commuting capital of Europe and people do commute uh, to go to work, to go to university and to go to college. So I think it's it's a valuable life lesson that you would learn in terms of you know coming here uh, and taking the bus even if you're coming from the other distance and so don't let transport stop you from coming to outstanding education. Absolutely, I, I often said to students when I've, I've been to them about it in the in the past, and um, the opportunity to be able to read a book or something you know and not have to drive the car is actually really not that many of you will be driving cars but but still uh, there's that opportunity for you to go over notes and, and things. We, we also have our college buses so mm -hmm. students will uh, commute in with their friendship groups yeah, of so they have a you know they often say it's one of the best parts of the day coming in, in into college in that way and then uh, you know students have said to me well miss I'd rather travel a little bit further and be at the college that's right for me all day yeah. and have that all day experience in the in the right place uh, then, then not not do so. So it's just judgment, and it's what people feel is best for them. Yeah, absolutely. Really good, good answer. Part-time jobs been um, brought up, and obviously it's a brilliant opportunity for young people to get a part-time job, and we would actively encourage that. But Tracy, there is there was some research done, wasn't there, about part-time jobs and, and the impact that that may have if you do over a certain amount of hours what's the sort of guidance on that? Yes yeah, so I mean obviously a part-time job um, it uh, gives a young person fantastic opportunity to gain some work experience and um, obviously as well some additional income but yeah we would normally say that um, you to, to limit the number of hours so that it doesn't impact on the studies and we normally say from six to, to eight hours or so as a, as a maximum as a guide really um, students should be looking at otherwise we find that um, the, the, the demands of, of A-level study um, are such that, that it really does start to impact on the studies. Yeah, so. brilliant. Uh, so good, good. Uh, there's a question here, should the personal statement be about a page or should it be any longer than that? Um, I would suggest it should be around about a page long. Uh, that hopefully will give a young person um, sufficient space to be able to express all that they want to. But obviously, you know, we do want them to be able to apply to us and feel that they can say everything they want. But you know, the main focus this year is the GCSEs and that's <laughs> where they need to be put in their energy. So yeah. they do not need to feel that they've got to do three, four, five pages. You know, it, it, that, that's not where their energy should be going. Focus on your homework, focus on also taking a bit of time out and a, a bit of time for themselves. Um, and if they want to go a little bit over, then that's fine. We're not putting any hard or fast rules in, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't want anyone thinking that they've got to write pages and pages and pages because that really isn't necessary. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, there's a question here about performing arts as in other roles. I'm head of performing arts as well. I'll answer that question. The question is, can you do performing arts 
additionally to the subjects? The answer is yes, of course, uh, you can. We have uh, musicals, plays, concerts and lots of opportunities. And of course, we host and produce the Mansep Shakespeare Festival every year as well. This year, given the circumstances, we're doing a lot of virtual uh, events. So through the whole college year, we're doing uh, an event called uh, Loretto's Greatest Hits, which is the past 10 years of shows at Loretto. And we're doing little scenes and snippets and songs and things. So our current students will be restaging some of those key scenes from those productions. We'll be filming them and publishing them on YouTube through the year. Uh, and that will be happening as we go. And obviously, if restrictions lift and things move, we'll be able to do things in a certain way. But we certainly haven't just stopped. Uh, we've, we've, we've continued with things. So, so that's where we are with that. Um, yeah, lots of people are asking about personal statements and that idea of uh, of this because students clearly want to come here, which is wonderful. Um, Michael, in your experience, uh, the actual interview, being in interview, let's just talk through that in a moment. Um, when they come to us, it's very casual. It's a, it's a conversation that's both sort of um, professional because they want to give the best sense of them, but also we are incredibly reassuring and casual. So uh, just in terms of anxieties, what what advice would we give to young people who are the succeeded in getting an interview at the college what do they need to be thinking about i mean the things just need to be themselves really they need to have thought about the, the kind of subject that, that, that they want to do because obviously as you see it's kind of semi-formal um interview that that we have so we want them to be as, as, as much at ease as possible because we want to get the best out of them so you know just go in with a positive mind frame uh, and 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 you know, don't don't let anxiety get get the best of you because we're nice people we looked after you uh, we want to make sure that you know we are the, the the right choice in terms of the college and and more importantly that it is also the right choice in terms of subjects that you want to do with us uh, because the focus as andrea mentioned earlier on should be your gcse this year uh, and we, we don't want you to start you know and being too anxious about next year you know, you've got to focus on the gcse so you know, we're nice people we look after you you know just Think carefully about what you want to do and what you want to ask us and make sure that we, we help and support you. Yeah, um, there's a lovely question here from Jordan uh, Tracy. Will studying A-levels be hard? Um, and and, and I mean, we'll leave it there. There is an additional part of the question, but um, I think that's a, a really good, a really good question because I think a lot of people are asking it and, and sort of worries about, well, this GCSE is like this. Will A-levels be hard? It's a lovely question. Um, I think, um, Challenging is, is perhaps a, a better word than, than hard, but um, there are additional challenges when um, students move on to a post-16 study, um, but they will be studying the, the um, fewer subjects, so they have to, to bear that in mind. Um, so you'll, you'll choose um, three subjects if you're, you're choosing A-level subjects and, and b tests to go a, a alongside that, um, and you'll study them in greater depth. Um, and there, there is a, a difference in terms of the, the level of, um, of knowledge and, and skills that are required at A-level. Um, yes, but um, we find that the, the majority of students make that transition. Um, and don't forget as well that we've got an awful lot of support um, when you come into college yeah. um, to help you make that transition. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably worth noting as well that um, you know, if you're doing A-level, let's say A-level biology and every student has studied a, a biology at GCSE, um, that's that's something that's a continuation. But if you come and study law or sociology, you won't you won't have you won't have done that before necessarily. So there has to be a point at which we you know we're very skilled in in, in getting people uh, where they need to be. Going back to the point that Trish is raised, raised is challenging, but also really exciting. Yeah. Uh, because you can focus on the subject that you've done. You know, you're, you're in a different environment. It just prepares you for the next step in your life because you know after you leave college, you know many of our students go to university. Some goes to apprenticeship or to work, and that again will be a different set of skills. We have different level so we really prepare you for that next you know with that stepping stone be yeah. before where you were to where you're going to yeah um, mm -hmm. so challenging but exciting brilliant um andrea say fans asked a question when can i come and look around uh, the college and meet the teachers well um we are hoping to be able to hold um a, so an open event and a taste today maybe in the spring term maybe in the summer term but obviously as we're all very much aware things are very much in change and flux at the moment and um, so we will have to wait and see what the national guidelines are but that's what we're really hoping to be able to intend to do because normally at this this term we would have had our two open days where we'd have had people on site 
and today would have been a day where again we'd have had people on site we've not been able to do that unfortunately and we hope that today's event instead gives a flavor of what college life will be like and an experience for students albeit in a very different way but hopefully as i say in the spring or summer term we'd love to have students and families on site to be able to come around and really experience life to a first hand Great, thank you. Uh, Tracy, we've had a question about can you print resources on site, but this links to a question about uh, sort of facilities and things. I mean, we are broadcasting live from our library. Uh, we're in our and we've got a career section here. We have five study centres. I mean, I mean, you know better than anyone being responsible for all the resources in the college, but uh, students uh, will be wondering if they don't have a computer themselves or printers, etc what uh, can they do whilst they're here to print the resources? Yes, yeah, sure. So as you said, we, we've got a number of study centres here on site and students can come into the study centres um, and print resources and they're, they're given a number of printer credits when they come into to college. So yes, um, but more broadly, as you, you mentioned, we have um, study centres and our library um, that are available for private study. You can um, loan books uh, and so on and so forth um, and also use uh, computer facilities or Mac facilities um, that are available those, those are available here for students to use on site. Yeah. OK, good. Um, a question about work experience, uh, Michael. Is The question is, do you help us find work experience? Now, obviously, students are they're in a challenging point at the moment, aren't they? Because businesses and et cetera are under very different circumstances now. But in usual circumstances, um, and we're offering advice, we ourselves don't deliver work experience necessarily. Oh, yeah. um, but if you could answer that, do you help us find work experience? Absolutely, yes. And we've got a member of staff say, you know, part of the careers team was dedicated to look after the work experience. As you said, Danny, we are in difficult circumstances, yeah. uh, but difficult doesn't mean impossible. And we're continuing to try to help our students to the best of our ability in terms of finding places where, where they can do. I mean, we have, as, as person Andrew Andresi said, delivered things uh, by you know, e-learning and, and, and virtually, uh, and some some work experience are doing the same at the moment. So I think we're all adjusting to, to, to the new world that we're going through, uh, but absolutely we'll be there to support you with, with that work experience. Okay, thank you. Andrea, a question, uh, how would you know what qualification is better for you? It's quite a broad question, but I think um, for a student who is maybe just completely at a loss as to what they want to do, how, how, how can they find that out and, and what advice could they give uh, for that? Well, I always think of a year 11 as a journey and there's a good number of students who make an application or start to come to us at open day who have an idea of the subjects that they're interested in, in studying. And by the time they actually join us and begin those subjects, some of those subjects would have changed because during this year, what students should be doing, indeed, uh, do, uh, we, we see lots of experience of students doing, is finding out about what they're interested in what career uh, subjects, uh, what subjects they might need to uh, do for a particular career. They learn more about themselves, I think, in year 11, about what skills they want to develop, what subjects they enjoy, and what subjects they're good at. They take advice, they take advice from school, from family, friends, from colleges and so on. And then, of course, they get the GCSD results and that informs those decisions and choices as well. So it really is a journey. So I, I did urge all young people not to worry too much at this stage and to uh, do their research. Uh, go on our website, have a look at our subjects, find out more information, experience those in the way that they, put, that they, they can do um, and make those decisions as they go along. If they put particular subjects down on an application form and we give them an offer of a place and interview them, provided they've got the entry criteria to do those subjects, that will be absolutely fine in terms of changing those subjects as well. Just like doing subjects that you enjoy, meet a, 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 a career ambition if you've got one, um, and uh, you know encourage a, a love of learning excellent thank you very much tracy is there a strict dress code we've been asked um no there isn't a strict dress code so students are, um, are free to to wear what they want um we would uh, ask that um the, within the realms of uh, um of, of avoiding uh, things with uh, perhaps offensive slogans and, and things like that, but uh, students are, are largely free to wear what they want here. Yeah, and yeah. um, something I note on that, uh, um, I mentioned earlier at the very start of the day that Loretto is a worldwide institution. We have Loretto's all over uh, the world, and so uh, some of those Loretto um, uh, institutions do have uniforms. We do not have a uniform, and mm -hmm. and that's that's probably where some of the questions are coming from in terms of the strictness of it. Um, there's a question really that, that, that's very broad and I don't think that uh, and there, there's one single answer to this so I'm just I'm just asking you from a sort of broad perspective because there really isn't and someone's said what makes Loretto different from other colleges 
Now, given the fact that we all have a particular remit in the college and have been here for you know, a certain amount of times, etc., and we will all have a different perspective on this, um, I just think it's a really lovely question to, to for us what we think, um, how, how we differ. We've all worked in different institutions um, as well. So um, what makes Loretto different from other colleges? Andrea. Loretto is a values led organisation and our values are based on our foundress Mary Ward. And one of those values is excellence. And for me, it's the all encompassing value because it means that we strive for excellence in everything we do. So it doesn't matter for a student if it's in um, uh, an academic subject, we want excellence for that experience for them. It doesn't matter if it's around something to do with student support, it doesn't matter if it's about um, guiding them in terms of the next step, may, next steps maybe a UCAS application. Even going on a college trip, we always strive for excellence. So I think that's what really sets Loretto apart, that we want the very best for our young people in every aspect of their experience at Loretto. Thank you. Tracy, for you, what, what might be your sort of? Um, I think the the community and the, the communities within the community um, and we um, bring students in, as, as Michael said earlier, from um, far and wide from all across Greater Manchester and, and bring them into Loretto and students make uh, the keep existing friendships and they make lots of new friendships and um, it's all about that the, those communities within within the, the, the wider community um, and um, Andrea referenced one of the our values another is joy and um, I think that 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 brings with it the bring these communities together it really does sort of bring together and encompass the, the joy of and the love of learning that we, we nurture here. Yeah, good. Michael, for you? Yeah, those values as well underpin everything that we do and, and what I, I found really fascinating here is is how much staff care, how much you go the extra mile for the students um, and there's a real positivity and real joy across the campus mm -hmm. uh, both from, from the, the, the staff population and the students population. You walk around and people are just really happy to be here really happy to be on site and you know speaking to many parents they always think they always congratulate us on how much staff go this extra mile for their sons and daughters how much you really care and it's not just about the two years here they're thinking ahead they're thinking long-term strategy about how can we help our young people who are coming here to plan for their future to be ready for whatever awaits, uh, awaits them after after college brilliant thank you uh, for me my sort of thing, and obviously I agree with all of these things, this is why there can't be one single answer, but for me, we, we obviously promote all of our subjects, but the one thing that we really, really are, uh, you know, very actively promoting is the, the wider opportunities for our mm. students, because the idea of educating the whole person, it's not just about getting the great grades, it's about making sure that you are a well-rounded individual so that you can go onto the working world and be be successful. I think that, for me, is, is the thing. Um, We've got two minutes left, um, but I do want to just take this moment to thank you all for, for attending. I hope you found it really informative uh, to thank our technical team um, for all the logistics of, um, you know, sanitising chairs in between uh, panel guests, etc. All of those things that come with the planning of these events. Um, and I really do hope you found it informative. And um, if there's anything to take away from this, it's please get in touch. If you have a question, just get in touch with us and communicate with us. Um, there has been a final question here, so I will I will just um, ask it. Um, there's, there's some year 11s um, work on, on the website, some preparatory stuff. Do you have to complete this? What, what we put on there is for anyone who's thinking about transition, um, is about uh, thinking about the things that might be looked at. So it's a supplement to our course information. Um, you know, these are the types of things that you'll study at A level. There is absolutely no uh, no pressure on you to do those activities whatsoever. It's there for you if you want it. And as Andrew and many of the other panelists have said today, the most important thing for you to do right now is focus on your GCSEs, focus on school, on now, and then uh, and put in your application to us if you if you wish to. That would be our, our very best advice. Um, there will be um, a survey sent out to you um, by email, and also we'll pop it on the group chat in a moment. Uh, complete that survey off. Your feedback's really important to us because, as uh, Andrea said, uh, excellence underpins everything we do, and we want to ensure that everything that we um, uh, undertake is done with that in mind. So, if you could give us your honest feedback, that would be brilliant. Um, thank you very much, panelists, for being here. Thank you for coming to watch. I hope you have a lovely weekend. All the very, very best, and the very best of luck in your GCSEs. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you.